Um, good evening and, and thank you for coming to our event this evening. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Peter Burry from Intel. So Peter is a graduate of the University of Limerick, a principal engineer with the Intel Quark team. Uh, he's been working on embedded operating systems and embedded platforms. And he has developed software for telecommunications, telecommunications and industrial platforms. Uh, and recently published a book entitled um, Embedded Computing. Um, this event has actually been hosted by the uh, Energy and Environment Division, the Electrical and Electronic Division, and the Computing Division. And we're also joined by uh, a group in Cork. So I'd like to welcome them who are looking at this online um, uh, through, through Paul Dean. So without further ado, um, thank you very much and uh, look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like it to be interactive if we can stop me and I guess we've got somebody hosting the WebEx chat room as well. They don't, I guess they don't dial into the bridge, right? They, there's no audio, so they ask questions and then I can answer. Okay. So that's the way it is. Um, so stop me at any time, ask questions, the more interactivity, the better as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I thought I'd start off just giving an overview of, of Intel. A lot of people. Um, can think of Intel as the big factory out in Kildare. And over the years, we've built up a slightly larger presence, and there's a there's a lot more um, R and D being done besides the, the overall factory. So, I'm based in the Shannon site down in Clare. Um, we're there since 2000. We've got about 250 engineers down there, um, mostly R and D, and then a little bit of marketing and sales. Uh, but most most engineers are doing product development on both silicon software and related platforms. Um, <clears throat> up in Belfast, it's a recent acquisition for so a company called Equana. They do um, cloud-based software for, and we'll touch on some of the kind of software that we're running, but they do cloud-based software for telecommunications infrastructure. So that was a recent enough acquisition by Intel. Um, down in Cork, uh, there's a pretty large development center doing antivirus software. And for the Internet of Things, we are kind of tightly coupled to those guys because Security, you can imagine as we start putting these devices out in the field, securing those devices becomes really, really important. So we're working very closely with the guys on Cork in terms of establishing um, security mechanisms to put on these devices. Uh, at, at the root of these kind of things, we want to make sure that the data is and they're not hackable. So tightly coupling to those guys is really important. I was saying we've got the factory. Um, you probably saw the, 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 the latest announcement, the very significant fab investment going on out there. A lot of, uh, a lot of construction going on. Um, and at the moment, the site's got about uh, 5,200 employees. Across, sorry, across Ireland, we've got about 5,200 employees. Historically, the fab has been, sorry, the, the site and leadership has been a design fab, a fab site. Um, but more recently, in the last two, maybe three years, uh, we started a, a silicon design team. And that's where Quark came out of. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Quark and what it was for Intel. Um, but the design itself uh, was all hosted out of uh, out of Leakslip, and the tagline we have internally is basically we were designed to do other things, and that goes beyond just the silicon that we created and designed in Leakslip and Shannon, um, but that that two kind of extra portions that we have coming from uh, Epona in Belfast and uh, McAfee down in Cork. So from an Irish kind of story point of view, really good. We just an awful lot of uh, collaboration work that's going on amongst us. And we really view um, our, Intel's presence in Ireland as an Irish presence. We're like we're not Bleak Slip, we're not Shannon, we're Irish presence. And especially, I'd imagine that you working, some of you working for multinationals, having a, a good footprint and being able to collaborate across our own sites is really important for us. So we're doing an awful lot of that, and it's really, really helping out. So this is our CEO. Um, uh, he funded this Quark development that I'm going to show you and talk about a little bit later. Um, out of his own kind of kitty uh, a number of years ago. So well before he was CEO, this was a, a pet project of his. Uh, when he became CEO, we became very fortunate. Now, sometimes you have to make some of your own luck. The chip worked as well. So if it hadn't worked and we were, and he became CEO, we would have been, <laughs> maybe not, I wouldn't be talking here. I'd be looking at some other that. Yeah. So, like the center thing, you make your own luck, but um, we had a lot of luck in terms of the the, the, um, the succession planning that happened at Carlin. So 
um, as soon as uh, he became CEO, he basically decided to launch the, the Quark family of devices. So Intel is known for instead of Xeons in the servers and the, the core family in your laptops, Atom um, in tablets and uh, phones. And to put it in perspective, this product family is the next level down. So um, Intel has a very large breadth of communication capability or com computing capability. <clears throat> and um, there are a lot of competitors below us, so we decided to enter the market below Adam. So take one step down in terms of performance uh, and power and such. So I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But we got launched at IDF. So for the team in Dublin, this was a big deal. Just kind of put it in perspective, a new architect in Intel is only launched every maybe 10 years. So it's pretty, it's a pretty rare thing to have a new um, microarchitecture or a new kind of platform launched. So they, in Ireland, this was a, this was a very, very big deal for our site. Um, he's holding up the device there on the, this is the picture on the left is our device. So small little chip and he's holding up the, up launching it. I have links on the bottom of these, by the way, most, I think all of them are public. So um, I've got links to kind of capture if people want to look up offline. I keep saying Quark and uh, actually maybe a little show of hands in terms of the engineering background, just electronic engineering, civil engineering. Most or industrial, electrical, electrical. Okay, so you in the valve era. <laughs> okay. Um, all this is really trying to show is um, this is what we do. I mean, this is the Intel bread and butter. We we make this. Um, I'm going to try and show you size of this one. Size of this one in comparison. I don't know if this is going to work on the camera. The lighting isn't very good here. And I can't see what's on camera. So um, this is the is the device here itself. So it's about I say the lighting. Say the lighting won't work for the for the web. Um, is this like that? Okay. So the actual chip itself is maybe the size of my fingernail, um, and that's what we we create. We spend about two and a half years designing all of the the, the circuitry that went onto this. Um, it's done on a 32 nanometer process, so it's a, not the latest Intel process, but it's far in advance of a lot of our competitors in this case. So, um, what that process gives us from an Intel point of view is the ability to make it small and lower manufacturing costs and uh, low power. What we basically have here is almost like a PC on a chip. So, historically, you would have seen, we'll say, motherboards in, in, in in machines, uh, you would have had a big kind of clunky CPU, you would have had another few chips around it, uh, some extra interfaces. What we've done in this design is effectively take a, a PC, almost an older piece, older generation PC, and collapse the entire thing onto one chip. Um, so the interfaces that we put on this chip are all the things that you would have in a normal PC. And then we also try to extend the capabilities of the chip to be applicable to industrial and IoT markets. So in order to run a chip, you need like storage of, you need different types of memory storage, um, but you also need special interfaces. So this device is really a combination of our, our hybrid of a PC kind of chip and these interfaces that can be used um, to connect to the real world. So everything is all in the one, one device itself. And then on the software side, uh, we do an awful lot of software and everything. It's, it's not sufficient to go to market anymore with just a, a single chip device. There's a huge amount of software development that goes on to run on that chip to make it useful. And both the software development happened in, again, in Leakslip and Shannon. Um, but we've also got partners within Intel that do a lot of the software development. So um, this is kind of a kind of market change. Historically, Intel could just provide the CPU and, and people would drive their own applications. As we scale down into this space, there's a lot more expected. People want time to market, people want reference designs. And I, I will be showing you kind of some of the reference designs that we do to actually use, make, make the device useful in the real world. As, that, as it stands, as a standalone device, it's just not, not that useful without the extra software. We spend probably as much time doing software development for these products as we do for the silicon aspects itself, even though as a company, we're primarily known for the silicon aspects. We do. Um, so the question can't be heard about open source software. We've got two strategies. The, the primary strategy is Wind River, sorry, is uh, open source Linux. Um, 
there's a project called Yocto, which is basically a mechanism to build your own Linux distribution. It's a bit like you couldn't you couldn't just take a desktop distribution and, and port it onto a device like this. It would be too heavy and too you have too many things installed. So in an embedded system, typically you have a, another tool that selects what you want to put on. Even though it's fully compatible with all the Linux software, it would just be too big for the, for the size of the performance device. So there's a thing called Yocto out in the open source. And what it allows you to do is select the exact things you want to put on the embedded platform. And then you just get what you need versus the big couple of gigs bloat. Because um, I guess it, it can run it, but if you, especially for embedded systems, you only want what you need on there because there's a cost implication for anything that you, you put on there, right? So if you have a large distribution of Linux, you have a large memory footprint and it's just slowing you down and costly. And then I didn't really talk about it, but we, Intel acquired a company called Wind River, and they are probably the main, one of the main embedded software operating system companies in the world. Uh, so what they do is they take the open source Linux and they, they commercialize it, they productize it, and they harden it. Um, one key thing about Linux in the open source, for instance, especially if you're using it for industrial platforms, what happens if something goes wrong? What happens if there's a bug, right? There's nobody in the open source community that you can just call. Nobody's there to answer a call. So there's companies out there, their job basically is to commercialize it and they'll give you support contracts for the five years or whatever the time that you need that the device will be manufactured for. So if there's bugs or defects in the open source software, you can call them, call them they repair them and send you updates. Similarly, um, security and keeping, keeping systems secure is a challenge. I'm sure you all have corporate laptops that are getting uh, updates pushed to them regularly, patches, updates. Um, uh, if you don't keep a system like this patched, basically software that's in the field can have vulnerabilities that were written, let's say, 10 years ago or five years ago. So it's important that there's mechanisms to keep the software up to date that just removes the vulnerabilities that are there, just like you do in your IT shop. Um, it's not that usual, and this is a part of a, a kind of transition for Internet of Things type devices. It's not that usual to keep them updated. It's more and more important that we keep these updated now. Um, and a standard question, in this, in this kind of scenario, everyone has a, uh, an access point at home, I'm sure, uh, a home router, gateway. There's a good chance it's running Linux. There's a good chance it was written with software three or four years old. Um, people can go on the web and for that particular Linux version, just get a list of all the vulnerabilities and pop in or break in through those vulnerabilities and access your home network, change your default gateways or change your DNS lookup so you don't go to Google or you don't go to the bank. Um, in general, embedded devices, we have to start considering the update lifecycle of them far more. And that's what we're trying to address with some of our software to look at the devices in the field over time, making sure that they're updated. So there's a lot more to it than just uh, keeping the device going. Um, so this is sort of a timeline. Uh, we launched a chip in last September. Uh, it was launched earlier than we had planned. The uh, CEO came in quite bullish, go, no, no, we're launching quick. Um, at the tail end of that, uh, we wanted to get the device out and about. So there's a education and kind of maker market out there. I don't know if people are familiar with maker movement or have ever heard of the maker movement. Um, I have some slides on it. It's a very kind of uh, eclectic mix of companies and people that go out and just create technology and use technology for all sorts of um, all sorts of use cases. So there's a company called Arduino, um, which is in uh, Italy. It's formed by a guy in Italy. Got 20 or 30 employees. And they developed easy to use hardware uh, that can be used for little prototypes, little demos. Um, artists started off using it initially, but now these kind of platforms get used for all sorts of simple prototyping. Uh, they're very accessible, uh, very easy to use. And what we decided to do was basically look at that marketplace and, and um, the kind of innovation that it fosters on platform and try and tap into it. And then we, so to do that, we basically had to create our own board, which had very similar properties to this Arduino um, platform. So what I'm holding up here and waving in front of the camera is our version of an Arduino platform. Uh, and there's a kind of a header here, which is really an extension interface. And there's a huge number of add-on modules uh, out in the market. Like if you go to Maplin or, or PC, whatever, PC World to a lesser simple place like Maplin, 
you can buy all these adapters to plug on so you can get sensors, you can get light sensors, you can get um, motor actuators. There's a whole pile of kind of hobby electronics kind of feeling and things that you can plug onto this. And I, and I have a demo here. Um, but there's a huge amount of innovation. This is what kids are often starting off to learn uh, technology with now. And as Intel, we weren't there. So we wanted to, to create this board. So shortly after we launched the chip, we'd had a kind of a prototype design, something like this in the background, kind of in the back of our mind, let's do something uh, again. Um, we got into this kind of rapid pace of, of, of development and we created this board in about two months and did all the software development for it and, and, and pushed it out. And these are for sale, uh, unlike normally for Intel, isn't it, isn't it push now, but <laughs> they're generally available right then. As Intel, it was often hard to get this kind of platform, but this is going out to the normal distances. Um, it's in Fry's in the US, so it's in the kind of normal place where people find hobby electronics. And we're finding huge amount of um, like web traffic and, and community spirit building up around the device, and people are just trying different things and making use of it. So it's really nice to get into that market, get kids learning with it, get people prototyping with it. It's very accessible. This is the maker movement. I just took some slide shots uh, of where, where it's gone on. There's one in the UK. I think there's a mini one in the Science uh, Center here in, in TC, in Trinity. Um, it's in Shenzhen in, in, in China. The big one is in, in San Francisco. Um, basically, people creating things, um, mix of technology, artistry, prototyping, innovation, kind of kind of a, a culture. Um, you may have heard of 3D printers. Uh, 3D printers, they they, they make or botch that kind of thing. That all part of that ecosystem. People sketch up designs quickly and and try them out. So using technology for cases that it wasn't obvious and it's very, very easy to use and very easy to do. So there's a, so obviously everyone has competitors. So um, uh, originally the Arduino itself, they, it was a very, very simple microcontroller. So this is like a, this is a full CPU processor, like a Pentium-like era uh, machine. The original um, uh, Arduino, and they still offer it, the kind of the main baseline Arduino is a small little 8-bit microcontroller. So it, it basically runs a little busy loop and check the sensor and have to, it can do a small amount of processing. This uh, can do far more processing. So where people were trying to add innovation, they're starting to look at more complicated things. The performance of that other product um, was, isn't, isn't as high. So this is a far higher performance product. And we have a higher level of integration. So um, people have to be say, add a shield to get Ethernet or add a shield to get Wi-Fi, whereas we have it on the, on the platform already. So we have a higher level of integration than the normal products. Um, but there's also, to, I guess to, to be fair, there's also products like this from our from other competitors out there. Um, people may have heard of Raspberry Pi. Yeah. So Raspberry Pi is a similar kind of thing trying to get into the into the maker market. Um, this is a step forward for my perspective for Intel to like to move down. We haven't been in this space. It's a very innovative space, but we have competitors at the chip level and at, at the board level and the platform level. Um, This is our spec, but there are we have competitors that are there's a there's a CPU manufacturer called ARM out of Cambridge in the UK. Um, those those CPUs go into SOC, this is called an SOC system on chip. Um, the ARM ecosystem, as we call it, basically is a CPU and lots of different vendors like Texas Instruments, Freescale that used to be Motorola. So there's lots of competitors in this space. I wonder if we're under no illusion. This is our first uh, foray into it. So. Um, it's but it's a competitive market and uh, this is our first step in i can show youtube or i can just you can look at them offline and um, i think this this is really just showing some examples and i have some boards i can show as well i'll probably just bypass these for now okay i was going to do an Arduino demo but the wi-fi is here it's not very good so I can show you what it would have done a little bit. Um, just to kind of show the accessibility of some of the technology. Um, 
the camera's over here, unfortunately. And you can sit down later and see it. But basically, same board here. And we have a little breadboard. I don't know if you can remember breadboards that seen in that then. And it's just a small little circuit doing the light sensor. It could be any kind of it could be any kind of sensor, but simple and start doing a light sensor uh, application. Uh, historically, you get lots of applications like that, right? Some, something simple, doing a little bit of sense and maybe actuation. The key for all of these product is, products is connectivity, right? So the kind of static data model of gathering data on a device, maybe doing a little bit of processing, that's no longer interesting. That's kind of bread and butter for a lot of different platforms. So what I'm going to show here is a kind of an evolution of simple homemade kind of uh, systems where you can get data into the cloud onto the onto the internet, uh, moving that onto um, kind of connected data acquisition systems for, for more commercial use. What this is showing is that there's there's a number of platforms out there, and they're designed to take data from devices like this. So this Arduino platform is running. Um, a couple of hundred lines of C code, so that's not a lot, uh, and I can I can walk through it offline if people do want to see it. But it's really just a very small amount of software, and take a sample reading from that sensor and send it to the cloud. And then you've got companies like uh, Zively, and there's, there's about four or five different other companies in this space. Basically, they offer a service where they just take that data, they archive it, and they can graph it for you. So you've got simple accessibility of of the data that's streaming off that device. This will evolve over time to more sophisticated applications, and we're going to talk about some of the ones that we, we are working with vendors with. But this is just a very simple case for, for almost no cost. You can get five, five devices for free with this company, and you hook them up, a couple of lines of code. Um, really, you only end up changing maybe 10 lines of code out of these applications to get your sensing value into, the, into this environment. And there's a big eco kind of system building up on this as well. So. Uh, for instance, if you had a, a light threshold changing or a, a noise in your house or, or many other kind of things, they can be sent to this environment and then people can do if then do the something kind of logic. So you can get systems and there's a company called if then do that that can feed off this data. Um, it's another web service. So you get this whole kind of correlating back-to-back uh, -back web services. One is gathering the data, pushes it in, then you have another service saying, I'll take any threshold crossing information that you want and then convert it into an SMS or an email. So you can rapidly build up use cases where, um, I don't know, if the kids come home after 5 or 2 a.m. in the morning, whatever, you can do your own rules that, that are based on, on simple monitoring. And this is all kind of home to easy to do stuff. The imagination is really the, the only bottleneck. Uh, Wi Fi was down, this was streaming earlier. Uh, and if I block the lights, basically you'd see, this is where you can, you can see where it stops streaming here. Um, I've been here for quite some time, but it stopped streaming at that point. It was streaming earlier on. And you can just graph the data, gather the data, you can pull it back down and, and make use of it. Are people interested in seeing that code to low level? No, that's fine. I didn't know what the audience would be like, so. So that was pretty much the full screen, that's right. That's kind of the, the uh, maker movement. Um, but as, as Intel, we kind of see two opportunities to uh, add this kind of IoT capability to, to platforms. Um, one is you can design it in, right? Uh, or you can go brownfield. So designing it in, time to money, it's like everything else, take a long time. Uh, new equipment is only, especially things like capital equipment, manufacturing equipment, um, air con systems, or these things do not, do not get uh, changed that often. So there's a far better monetary opportunity in terms of money opportunity to go into the market with something that can connect to existing infrastructure and add value, right? So that's what we're looking at more than just um, trying to get new designments because it did take too long before they're uh, commercialized. So we've created a, a gateway um, and it's in a, that, those two boxes over there are two examples of the gateway. 
And things we focused on, one is the physical connectivity to the real world. So you see things like RS-45 interfaces. Um, we're looking at things, things like backnet design. So looking at the standard industrial physical interfaces that you can connect to the real world with, and then robust radio communication uh, interfaces to, to take the data off. So this, this purpose of this kind of device is to sample data locally on a machine, either a legacy machine or connected to an environment where you can acquire data from um, existing infrastructure and get that data into a cloud environment for people to run analytics uh, functions on that data. So the trend is far is moving away from just simple command and control and knowing what things up, but actually looking at uh, data intrinsically coming from the system and, and run sophisticated data management, app, uh, data mining applications on it. So this is a reference board that we have. We, we deployed in industrial um, sites to, to do some data acquisition today. Yes. Why then? I have a slide on that. <laughs> I have one slide on that. Because as Intel, it's like uh, you have two, two pivots that you could make. The sensor infrastructure is dumb as possible, right? Cover the room with tiny little sensors with bleeding out uh, information. And that might be fine for some scenarios. There's other scenarios where the local processing will become more and more important. I have one slide to try and show why we think it's important. But there's two, I mean, the market will start off probably with the simple sending sensor and values off and start building up that cloud-based ecosystem to do analytics. We're trying to also bring that down to more local platforms. And local could be, in the Intel context, local could be the device that's on the table, or it could be um, like a, a, server, a rack server or a more sophisticated um, uh, compute environment. The applications will drive a lot of computes, and um, that, that's, that's what we're seeing. And it's not always prudent to send it all to a cloud. Oh, okay. Next time, sorry. Yeah, I will. They can't hear it? Yeah. Could ask it again. No, we move on. <laughs> Keep going. I, I'm getting to keep going here from the back of the room. Uh, maybe you guys don't care. This is our bread and butter, so I care a little bit more probably. Uh, all it's really showing is there's a lot of videos going on this on, on this platform. Comms is is key, right? So we want to get data, acquire data, and ship it off. So we have physical connections like the 10 10 100 interfaces, like the Ethernet interfaces, which you're probably all used to. We've got 3G cellular radios on there, so you can deploy it remotely. Um, we have a number of use cases where they're being deployed on top of buildings uh, in um, industrial air conditioning systems. And then we've got Wi-Fi. Uh, they, it's not always um, cost effective to put a 3G modem on everything, like the data plans aren't really set up for large volumes of data from large number of devices. So depending on the structure, you may have a a grouping of these kind of devices in a local area, so not one of them is nominated to have the 3G radio, just like your house. One of one thing has the broadband connection, and then the normal Wi-Fi radios are used for those other things to connect to the to the um, to the internet effectively through that 3G modem. Uh, and this design, we also have a Sky Energy capturing module. So um, one of the reference designs is to do energy monitoring of, of systems, and um, that can be used for um, understanding if the load is behaving properly, not just the kind of the metrics of whether it's on or off, but we can also use it to figure out if the load is behaving properly. And these kinds of attributes are things that we want to feed into the to the analytics infrastructure in the back end to understand whether or not there's behavioral changes in a machine over time. And so oftentimes there might be signatures of uh, or predictors of future failure based on Things that you wouldn't normally think of measuring, like they're not inherently important for the for the use of the device. But in many cases, <clears throat> there are sensor networks or there's information from a particular machine 
that can be used if we gather enough data over time, we can use that data to infer prediction probability or a prediction fa probability of failure um, over time. So that our platform is really kind of adding more sensors, gathering more data, um, shipping it off, and then trying to figure out whether or not there's there's a kind of goal in that in that big data sheet. <clears throat> this is a slide from uh, another company in the, in the ecosystem where they're gathering data um, using our platform, both in distributed, uh, um, what we call telematics use cases, which is effectively um, trucks and cars, fleet management. Uh, and then we also have a use case where we're capturing the data uh, in, a, in a number of factories. We're sending it to the device cloud. And then the key is sort of the, the connection to the, the cloud and stuff is plumbing in, in my mind, right? It's just so it's like you don't really care about your broadband right now at home. Right? All you care about is where you're going and what it's used for. Um, a lot of this will disappear as well, right? There's some complexity in getting the data off the device and to somewhere. But over time, that'll all melt away and you'll be really focusing on what are the applications. So what we're what, what Intel and our partners are trying to do is take that data and federate it out to multiple kind of use cases. So um, a particular data stream from a particular device might be interesting um, because of the application, but it might have also other broader interest uh, interests. Um, kind of a um, one of the use cases that start that that's kind of prevalent in the telematics environment right now is things like um, the the kind of pay as you go insurance model or behavioral car insurance model. So a lot of companies are creating dongles that they plug into the into the CAN bus in the car, they stream that data off and, and do analysis on the behavior of the driver, and, and that's why you. You wouldn't necessarily want to want to stream it, so you, you do local behavioral analysis, the braking, hard braking, swerving, the G sensors in the car can be all used to get an assessment of the quality of the driving or the kind of driving that's being done. Is it nighttime driving? Is it daytime driving? All that feeds into back-end analysis that the actuaries use to understand whether or not you better keep away. And so that's kind of a simple example of data being used on a car coming off the car. Um, other cases that they talk about, there, there's so many sensors in a car, the car knows exactly what condition the road is, for example. So why isn't that data being used to tell the public authorities that there's a massive pothole in one particular spot, right, before before we um, lose a couple of rims? So data that's useful for, for its original design intent, which is usually engine management systems and, and vehicle stability control, all that is useful information to send off of the car, and cars are being more and more connected to send off the car. Um, people like BMW might be able to resell that information. Right? So there's, there's a lot of interest in trying to understand what economic models will be built up from data acquisition and sending it off and, um, and reusing it. Uh, at the simplest level, these kind of, uh, sometimes IoT is called machine to machine, but so the term, terms are used often interchangeably in the market. Um, first one is just simple asset management. Is it is it up and running, is it there? Um, predictive service is a key one. Um, depending on the capital cost, downtime of capital equipment can be very significant from a production point of view or building controls, environmental situations. So it's very important to be able to predictively service uh, equipment. Um, we've worked with one vendor and I showed them the team they have that is effectively trying to build up this application suite. So they understand their asset management, they understand exactly what's in every platform that are replaceable parts with different SKUs, so they can always know exactly what's on the top of the building and the exact uh, makeup of a particular um, air handling unit. Uh, they're using predictive um, analytics to figure out whether or not it's likely to fail based in the history. Um, they can schedule service events prior to failure. Uh, when it does fail, they know exactly what to send out with the service technician, so it's not two trips in this scenario where they go to the top of the building, find out what's broken, go off to get the part. So huge efficiencies in, in service management and optimizing the routing of the service engineer to these environments. So all of this backend data is used to make a very, very uh, efficient routing uh, of the people. I'll probably leave this. Um, I think I touched on most of them. So actually, let me just talk briefly. So the things that you kind of want to do, you want to keep the system up to date, 
uh, both from a compliance and a verification point of view. I'm going to modify the configuration, just send updates control. So this is kind of the old normal stuff, command and control over remote. This is not unusual. Um, equipment health monitoring is becoming more, more viable. Utilization metrics, right? Um, interesting one is looking at the utilization of a factory or, or power utilization in a factory and then looking at the, the production runs and you might see that there's no variation in energy usage, for example in a in a factory environment even though it's only running whatever five days a week and the weekend should be low on so you can start to understand um, utilization metrics and then also augment that with manufacturing data and figure out if there's optimization that can be done in the factory environment um, system performance trends are, are, are key to understand whether or not the system is trading and it's likely to fail over time um, system diagnostics is just running running remote tests. Uh, predictive modeling, uh, again, it's a bit like uh, using system trend analysis to figure out if it's going to be uh, failures. And then fleet behavior. So uh, historically, people would look at one machine and kind of try and figure out what's going on. Um, in many cases, a manufacturer who puts something in the field, uh, it's really important for them to understand on, on, a, on a particular SKU basis, for instance, whether or not he's starting to see trends in behavior of the system that mean there should be a design change for the back end. So um, many things take fail, take, may take a while to fail in the field. So the more fleet level information you can gather from these kind of systems, the better because you can figure out, oh, maybe of a design flaw and I'm going to fix that design flaw before it um, hits the, the, the large production runs. This is trying to touch on a little bit of some of the why do you need smarter devices close to the edge. Um, invariably, the amount of um, sampling that you'd need to do to assess really the health of the system is too high for you to send every single sample um, off into the cloud. So my little demo that didn't work there was basically just a little light sensor and on and off. Nobody really cared whether I was streaming that every 10 seconds. Um, in reality, you might have maybe a vibration sensor on a device that can't be sending information off to the off to the cloud for every single sample. Right? So we've seen case, simple cases where you just do some simple DSP processing. So you take a let's say you take the time series signal here on the on the top left, um, which is coming from the sensor that could be a vibration. The normal environment for that vibration sensor might be the the, the FFT kind of in the, on the right hand side there, there's a normal behavior. And if there was a low level rumble, um, which would be effectively a lower frequency component, uh, that would be unusual. So what you would do is you would train the local system for the behavior that's normal. And the normal behavior is, okay, I've got this kind of frequency pattern in my vibration, it's all good. Um, and if I see any deviation, instead of sending off all these time series, time series samples and like every little uh, frequency, I just send an event saying, hey, I'm after seeing a new frequency at 20 hertz at this dB. So instead of sampling, you're just sending events. So there's very much a kind of a mode where you have to convert the time series information, which is much more important in this environment, to events. And moving that logic closer to the environment is, is more important. Otherwise, um, you'll just you'll just flood it. And just to kind of get a sense of uh, the kind of data rate. So, one sensor at one kilohertz, which isn't, which isn't a very fast, fast sampling rate in sensor terms, would generate two or three gigabytes per month uh, of data. So that's going to quickly um, flood any network, any storage medium. If you're trying to carry that over 3G, you'd have a huge bill, and that's and that's just one sensor. So, inherently, we need to move smarts, some of the smarts. Um, down close to the device and just send the, the useful key key information. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, I mean, on, on industrial networks, you've got things like Modbus. You don't want to be sending every single parameter. What you want to do is try and look at the behavior of the system and, and send deviations and, and, and compare and contrast from history, local history. Okay, Peter, should this work? Yeah. Um, so, uh, to, so to achieve that kind of local processing um, is the market demanding a certain price point for this and what kind of price point are you talking about um, I don't know what price point these kind of platforms are it, yeah I don't know how to answer that the, the market is not really well established in understanding 
what level of compute should be done locally versus remotely. Um, we we basically work with customers with kind of a, an economic model of okay, this is your application today. Uh, it could it could use this kind of compute, and this would be the the bandwidth cost, and then this would be the back end storage cost, and just help them understand that um, in some cases you need to discard lo information locally. Um, this is still kind of new; it's not well established. One of the kind of one of the big challenges, though, is that in many cases you don't know what you're looking for yet. So you have to kind of sometimes operate in this hybrid mode where you collect far more data, um, try and manage the administration of that somewhat locally, maybe in the local server in the factory, so that we so analysis can be done offline. Because there's a bit of a chicken and egg. Um, like how do you know what 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 uh, signal will be you could be used for the predictive maintenance indicator, unless you capture them over time. So this is part of the kind of dilemma as the as the market builds out. Where do you do the processing? Um, do you put it into a system where uh, you take the kind of cost initially to build up a history that's sufficient for you to do the analysis? So you then tell the local devices to subset the data. But there's always a risk and trade off there that you're throwing away something that becomes useful. Uh, but the costs are just explosive in terms of trying to capture everything all the time. So, but I mean, in Intel, we do capture almost everything all the time. We on our on our manufacturing environment, like because we have to find such small signals uh, for yield variation, we basically capture just a phenomenal amount of information all the time. But it's a different cost structure, right? It it, it, it can bear that that, that uh, level of of data acquisition. Um, I'm kind of trying to show some examples. I talked a little bit about drive this morning or uh, earlier. Um, Exceed is another company in the market that uses kind of data acquisition and plumbing. Uh, a lot of them are still largely focused on the simple, what I would consider the kind of simple self device management uh, updates, simple data acquisition, but they're all um, at the moment adding applications to the data. So that is really where a lot of the innovation will happen in, in, the, in the market in terms of trying to make better use of the data. And I mean, people are not going to deploy these systems hook it up to a data acquisition infrastructure unless there's some monetary value. So that's the business application at the end. And that's where a lot of the market is trying to figure out where where can you basically um, offer a service to an end customer that's valuable. Right? They're not going to just hook it up for fun. Um, so that's where a lot of the innovation in the market is happening. What to do with data, how to resell it to multiple sources if you want it, um, to try and make, make the most of, of the acquisition. So this is a specific, this is one of our lead uh, customers for, for this device, um, it's a company called Daikon Applied. Um, the, the kind of examples I talked about earlier in terms of being able to acquire data, have multiple units on, on the roof, uh, having a single data connection back, um, managing updates, um, looking at predictive maintenance, pulling extra data off. So this, this but this this platform internally has a standard industrial bus, uh, and we can extract into that bus, and we can query all of the devices in the system for just status bits, um, error reports, all that kind of information. That's uh, summarized in a digest and then sent off to the cloud for, for analysis. And corrective, sorry, taking corrective action is the big value for them. I mean, getting people on rules. Well, there's a couple of aspects. Getting people on rules is expensive. Having them go up to find out what's wrong, come back at a park, go back up again is very expensive. Uh, truck rolls are expensive. But they're also looking um, at the behavior of the system, back to the energy. They're looking at the signature patterns of the energy consumption of the compressors and the fans. Because if the compressor is not working well, it probably has an energy signature that, that's indicative of, of, of the problem. And that's been, been used to do that. Looking for time. So, I was going to move on to another demo, but I'll just skip past some of these level, low level details. The bottom line um, is that we have something like a gateway, uh, and on the table I've got two gateways, one pretending to be a machine generating random samples of, of information. Um, it's connected uh, via Modbus. I don't know if people know Modbus, but it's a, it's a pretty standard protocol in the industrial space. 
um, it runs over Ethernet or RS-485. It's a very common industrial protocol. So we can basically look at the protocol that's on the wire and take the samples directly off of it. So for instance, we might have a PLC talking to a particular machine. We can step in between those, take samples of the existing control loop uh, messages and use those to just siphon off extra information that's not um, readily available from the PLC already and send those out over, over a gateway. Um, in IoT, there's a lot of, um, in inner things, there's a lot of um, protocols out there and NQTT happens to be one that uh, IBM are pushing hard as being kind of the main transport protocol for, for messaging. So it's just a way of packaging the samples up and sending them off to the cloud. Um, lots of vendors are using, using NQTT. So what I do is I'll show a demo where um, we've got Modbus Gateway and then it's connected to the cloud. Um, and we've got a, a simple SCADA system running up in the cloud and we can just show some simple, uh, some simple live data. I'll skip this because I think uh, it's way too low level. The demo is, as I said earlier, Modbus simulation on one device. We're just pretending to be um, some batteries, solar generator, backup generator, and a wind generator. So we're just pretending to be um, a, a number of samples. And this picture is a static picture, and I hope. I hope it stayed up. Um, as I mentioned, the Wi-Fi in the room has been a little bit. Hmm, it's not live again. Uh, what this product, this is an external company product that we just used for, for this use for demo. Um, it's basically an open source SCADA system. Um, Obviously, if you're in a commercial environment, you probably have like a human scatter system or some, some high-end vendors, but this is an open source one we could just easily mock up. Uh, and they have a mechanism to just drag and drop graphical items and have gauges or graphs or values. I'm sure you've probably many of you seen things like this, right? Um, and what we're really doing here is, this is not, not rocket science. The uh, simple thing is we've, we've siphoned off the data from a, from a Modbus slate, so we're capturing data in situ, and we're generating the messages and farming, sending them off to the cloud. And this is just a simple web page showing then the, the overall um, values. Now, just before you all went into the room, these were all live updates. So all of these messages are would, would not be live updated. When does it stop? 20 past five. Um, so very, very simple way to, to mock up and just show that information over the cloud. As I said, this would be kind of for visual representation. The vast majority of uses that are being involved are to take those same samples and look at them historically over time to try and create insightful applications in terms of the behavior of the overall system. And that is what I had so far. I can show people the boxes in the room, at least um, you can handle them and play with them. Unfortunately, it's not live. Nothing was live. You got to fix your Wi-Fi. Hey, Peter, got, got a question for you. So, so oh, thank you very much. It was really informative. Um, so, a question for me would be: uh, How was Ireland position, positioned as being the place to develop this inter uh, the, the Quark platform and um, and how did you utilize skill sets that were in Ireland? Or how did you kind of um, bridge any gaps in those skill sets? Um, uh, some of it came about through luck. The, the location selection came a little bit through um, relationships and, and luck. So we had a design center. We have a design center in, in Shannon um, for since 2000. Um, we that Shannon Design Center was part of the um, is part of the embedded organization within Intel, and we had been doing many years ago. We did products based on Xscale, which is a, an ARM licensee uh, part, and then uh, at a higher level, Intel decided to focus on, on its own architecture. So we had been doing kind of similar embedded parts many years ago. The general manager, um, VP of the division. 
uh, always believed that we should go back and do something like extend down below the existing atom baseline that we have in the company. And he and I guess it, it really comes down to relations. He and BK, which is the CEO of, of Intel, um, they were both on Paul Alini's staff at the time, which is the, uh, the management staff. And they got in a room and said, we got to do something. We got to basically, there were kind of two kindred spirits. We got to go off and create something. Um, uh, BK at the time ran the fabs. So he ran half the company. Fabrication is about, fabs are about half the company. And um, he had a strong relationship with Eamon and uh, O'Hara here to, to talk about whether we could do something extra, as it were. And, um, part of the strategy for sites globally is always trying to do a bit more. Right? So you might have your pie, but it's always, especially Irish sites, right? We always have to look a little bit outside. So there was always um, people on the lookout for opportunities beyond what we do normally. So it came down that the the, the kernel of it came down to relationships. Um, we had a good track record in Shannon for people. We had executed programs. We um, we had gone to production with what we call A0 silicon, which means no no modifications, the design is done right first time. So any better group, historically, Ireland, and when I say Ireland versus Shannon, right? We we always try and brand it like that. Ireland had a good reputation. Um, there's no language barriers. Culturally, we're very aligned. So people, it seems like there's an affinity, if all things being equal, or business is business, but all things being equal, there's an affinity to, to put have work going on here. Um, now, IDA as well was hugely helpful um, in, in, in getting this to, to happen. So it's not just luck, it's luck, relationships, capabilities, and government uh, IDA help. Yeah. So it was a combination of all, all of them. Um, and like I say, if the. Uh, Sorry, Jerry Duggan, as I said, I date from the valve design, but I think it might be of interest to people to go back a bit earlier and it's all good for the horses. Because effectively, when IDA first brought into Ireland with a view to establishing a factory here or that here, Intel were quite clear in their mind. They wanted to locate in Dublin because they felt that that's where the variety of skill sets was most likely to be available. At the time, the Dublin City and County Manager believed that fab or wafer fabrication was a highly polluting industry. And he said he wasn't going to have it in Dublin City or County. And the IDA executives were tearing their hair out. And effectively, the, rather than the Intel guys going back in the plane, they said, well, come along to the Coral Race Course on Saturday once. And you can see what's on here. And they met the Kildare County Manager. At the, at the Curra. And the IDA guys quickly said, would you care to host Intel in Kildare? And they said, where's the nearest point to Dublin in Kildare? And he said, Deeks level. And that's why you're here. At a factory level, for sure. <laughs> yeah. There's and that's been confirmed by a former chief executive. Okay. I won't, uh, wouldn't try and contradict. I have a question online here uh, from Paul in Cork. How did the uh, Galileo and, and Raspberry Pi compare in terms of power, speed, etc.? Um, we're at a platform level. We're comparable. We're a bit. We our top speed is a bit slower. So Raspberry goes up to uh, 700 megahertz. Uh, we our current design is 400. We're going to five 500 in the next spin. So we're a little bit lower on on performance. Um, one of the most obvious gaps with Raspberry is we didn't we don't put any graphics on our platforms right now on these platforms. Uh, we have a higher scale atom designs that use all the, that have all the graphics, and that was a very deliberate choice that we're really trying to design something for gateways, industrial platforms, almost hidden underneath the underneath the cabinet as well to to do to do, do the grunt work and not bother with them the space. And I mean that that's that's really the two main main differences. Sorry, Jerry Duggan, apart from the anecdotes, uh, working with the Academy of Engineering at the moment and looking at means of trying to reduce fuel consumption in the transport sector, which in Ireland has been about the most intractable area in terms of reducing fuel consumption. And one of the key 
issues coming up clearly is that IT is probably the, has the greatest capability of helping to reduce uh, transport fuel consumption. And that's particularly true in the kind of the larger vehicles right. where the diesel engine has been really optimized. But things like what are called predictive cruise control, uh, where okay, the vehicle knows the terrain that's ahead and literally changes the acceleration, et cetera, so that you stop accelerating before the ground hill. And that technology is applied. But I'm wondering, have you looked at all at, say, taking the information from the forward, it, predicting what traffic lights will be doing when your vehicle arrives at that point, and then controlling the vehicle performance so that you minimize fuel consumption? Are, are you aware of any work in that area? Um, so, uh, answer in two ways, I guess. We are working with a, a US uh, telematics company that does vehicle kind of tracking information uh, and, and they haven't gotten to that level of sophistication in terms of like using the inertia in the terrain to figure out what to do with the with the control of the of the of the cruise control. Um, right now it's mostly there's still a lot to be saved on on just flight and uh, just understanding the behavior of the actual engine systems, uh, driver behavior is a huge portion of it. Now that often gets into very significant privacy concerns, um, legal concerns. So I, I touched on security earlier. We have to kind of have almost a legal path over, um, to keep our data safe, to make sure that it can be used for certain purposes. So there are um, applications like that being developed in, in this particular telematics company in the US. On the traffic light side, um, there's a whole pile of kind of car to car and intelligent transport system infrastructure being talked about for many years. Um, it hasn't clicked. It's a bit like trying to create a network with one computer. It, it hasn't really uh, happened yet. The information in terms of understanding the traffic system isn't broadcasted to in any environment. Um, Germany are, there is legislation in Germany heading down that path to, to do trial intelligent transport systems. But that that will happen. Like there's there's a lot of technology development, but it hasn't got the backing sufficiently of of a big country to make it wide scale. So without that information, you can't you can't easily do it. Now I have I have seen designs where the LED, the especially with the newer traffic lights, they're LED based. So you can ditter an LED uh, fast enough where it becomes effectively like a data communication link, and a sensor in a car can pick up. Um, the cycle time, if it's if it's visible, but none of it is standardized, and and this thing really takes standards. Like for cars to have a consistent way of doing something, it has to become standard in a big and a big geography has to mandate it, like the EU or or uh, Japan or the US. So it's it's definitely coming. It's just coming. It's been coming for a long time, and it'll it'll take a while to to take. You need a government, and and historically there was lots of money. Earlier, now the money's gone for those kind of things, so it's going to take a long time. I think. So one one more question on line was, um, so far, how far away from are we from seeing this technology deployed in smart homes? Um, that can happen now. Um, the the issue at the moment in the home environment is there's there's fragmentation and there's no standards that have worn out between them. So, um. You can, I mean, you can get, uh, if you're in the US, you'd probably, if you're, if you're an iPad owner or an iPhone owner, you probably have a Nest device. That's a, a siloed ecosystem. Um, you can control the temperature in their environment. Uh, it doesn't tie into any other application. You can um, buy a product in Home Depot, Home Depot, which is called a Quirky, which is a small little sensor device, again, sending off data to their own environment. So, Unfortunately, they're, all the applications are siloed right now, and until there's a breakthrough and, and we can get to a point where um, there's a level of cross-fertilization between the devices, they're, they're all going to be a little bit knick-knacky. Um, we are also working with, uh, energy is a big one, we're working with some um, providers of, of storage elements as well. So you, you, you can start to introduce control in the home. But the key will be to make sure that all these products start to, to talk together so that you can have a like a home level application built up for these devices.
but the technologies are there. It's just we have it, they haven't quite worked out yet. Yeah. Give us the um the the, the nice the, the spin at the advertising spin. Like where do you, do you see this technology in a few years' time? You know, what's the real positive best case scenario vision of where this technology is and the capabilities it can provide? But the key for it is to disappear. Right? Um, like you talk about the home, I think it will definitely take off in the home. I think there's some big vendors out there that that are sick of using kind of. It's not, they're all using standards, by the way. So there's so many standards out there that everyone can use a standard and they don't play. Uh, this kind of technology just has to disappear so that it, a bit like the Nest case, right? The Nest device, people don't see it as an IoT device. They see, they see it as a sensor that learns behavior of you in your home and adjusts appropriately. Um, these things will have to adjust appropriately automatically and become just invisible devices. They can't, we can't be having people going, let me go in and write my little special rule for my house if I do this and that happens and this stuff has to disappear because people I like to do it but I'm probably the wrong demographic to judge them what people will really do right they just want stuff to work and disappear um, any other questions Peter, I'd like to congratulate you on an excellent presentation and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, food for thought there. But I suppose the, the Internet of Things, it's a very, um, you know, it's a very attractive proposition. But, uh, you know, you have your slide there on, on uh, SCADA's uh, view of the web. I, I'm from a utility background. And, you know, we would uh, be very attracted to that. But at the same time, we would be very nervous about, uh, you know, all these small, rather, uh, you know, low cost, low complexity devices and uh, using them for uh, controlling very, uh, you know, key processes. Well, maybe that's, uh, you know, a bias due to not being familiar with the technology. But I, would I say, can charge you more for it if you want. Well, and <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess so. This one is education, right? So, uh, and hopefully, it doesn't affect the, the kind of branding aspect. These, these products, um, it's just an evolution of the things that you're probably used to, right? You probably have um, existing PCs running some of this logic already. Uh, these are just as capable as PCs were a number of years ago. So it's more, and they're just as robust and just as secure. So we, we have two very different design um, from the software and productization review. This is, this is cheap and cheerful. It's the same SLC. Uh, actually, it's not the same as you can talk about that. It's the, it's the same underlying silicon. The, the silicon that goes into this one is a more robust skew. So we have industrial temperature range skew, for example. We do far more testing on the, on the silicon. Um, we have a thing called ECC, which is error correcting control for the, for the memory. So the devices, even though they're the same base, they have different skews, and this is a much more robust system like this. We're, we're planning to do um, safety certification on that silicon, um, where it can be used in safety systems. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, call it small and low cost necessarily for any change in robustness. Um, this is running a full operating system. It it uh, it is using the same security technologies that we use on the high end. So really consider more of a miniaturization. It's not. It's not. Uh, it really shouldn't be considered any less trustworthy and existing systems. Um, the advantage here is that uh, a lot of the existing infrastructure is legacy, right? And um, even understanding its behavior, what about the control? But even understanding its existing behavior takes a, um, a, a lot of extra work. So the, the idea is to add these systems to monitor first and, and start inferring more data. Um, we can talk about that later. And if you're concerned. That, that typing in line happened to be a thank you No, So if, oh. unless there's any other questions in the, in the, from the audience here, I'd like to offer you a, uh, um, well, congratulate you on a really interesting talk and to offer a vote of thanks from, from the audience here. Uh, and we, before we, we just offer that uh, vote of thanks, there's just two things I want to draw uh, the audience's attention to on, on those online. And one is uh, 
the Energy and Environment Division has an AGM on the first Wednesday of next month, uh, as well as a lecture will be sending out the notification for that. And also that the um, there's a better building conference on the 9th of April. That's the uh, Green Building Council is is, uh, is bringing that forward. Um, so again, Peter, uh, thank you very much, and uh, I'd like to offer a vote of thanks in the normal way. <laughs>